Thank you, thank you. I'm not wearing purple, as you all know. That was the color of the Emmys. This, um, this talk will be about the business of fashion. Nothing that you're learning about. You are learning about design and creativity, but money is very creative. And the question has always been, is fashion an art or a business? So from my perspective, it's a business. I've only been in it for more years than your parents are alive. And um, as such, I've been a designer. And I did something as a designer that none of you will do. I worked for someone for 17 years who was a real son of a bitch. <laughs> but the end of it, I owned the business. OK? That's a different career path nowadays. You are not putting up with male or female, some of the things that we all had to put up with in our careers. Not necessarily sexual harassment, but just in general, the way people are treated, your expectations as an employee. But I just warn you that you must put up with certain people in order to learn. Not everyone who is smart is nice. On that note, we are going to talk about this global industry. We're going to talk about, can we make it here? Because of some of the saviors, not only with tariffs or time, is making it locally. And what is fashion retailing really about now? And what will it be about by the time you are executives? And I am coming from the attitude that you will be executives beyond the design room. Licensing an intellectual property is the key to your success and failure. And just some lessons, some technology, some trends. So here's the global aspect. I don't know if you can see. I think we still have a little bit too much light. Can we turn down any of these? That'd be great. OK? So right now, 87% of everything that anybody is wearing in this room or anywhere else comes from somewhere else. And if you were to have seen this five years ago, that big gray blog that is China would have been twice the size. So all of these expertise, all of these countries are eating away at China. They're not affecting domestic production. They're affecting that one area. And we'll talk about why that's important. Why do we do global sourcing? OK, there's large factories. If there are 2,000 machines running, it's much cheaper to make a garment than if there are 20 machines running. Up-to-date machinery. Every single other country funds machinery, funds technology. Only the United States does not fund up-to-date technology or machines. Labor intensive. When you do a five screen print, a 10 screen print, there are two people at each side of the table walking it through. You can't have that at $15 an hour. You can have that at $2 a month. Wide a variety of textiles. We cannot make down in the United States. We cannot pluck a duck, OK? We cannot do yarn dye. You know, your men's shirts that are stripes and plaids. Dyeing yarn is environmentally um, uh, problematic. So we can't do yarn dye. We can't do silk. We can't do linen. None of those things are made in the United States and cannot be made in the United States. So what you have is a wider variety of textiles. What global sourcing offers you as a production manager, as a maker, lower labor cost. But what they need is US management and predictive services. One of the interesting things that happened last year, one of my clients is uh, Alibaba. And I go to Hangzhou every year. And 
I do a presentation on what the American customer is doing, and it's all translated in Chinese behind me, except one word, one phrase, predictive services. They don't get it. They don't understand it. They never have understood it. They can make whatever you want right now, but if you ask them what will be coming in six months, they haven't a clue. We are the masters, US and EU, parts of the EU, on predictive services. So they need that. And the other thing I must tell you in my long history of travels, not one brand since my travels, my first trip to um, China and Korea was in 1973 for the business. Not one brand has ever come this way. Think about it. Not one brand from Asia has ever made it into the vast market. Yes, we've had Vivian Tam and we've had some couture designer here and there. But as a brand development, it only happens in the United States. So, the other side of the coin. Can we make it here? And to start a business, you must make it here. Your first group of things, are, you're not going to be able to give it to a factory that wants 300 pieces of a color and sometimes 300 pieces of a size of a color. You have to find a way to test it in the United States or Mexico or Canada. No, Canada doesn't make anything. Okay. <laughs> That's a side note that we will talk about later, the whole issue with Canada. Okay, so what do you get when you make it domestically? You can make 10 pieces. You can make smaller lots. You can make 10 styles. More SKUs per line if you want to make caftans. You can make 15 caftans, 20 pieces of each. You can't do that anywhere in the world other than a domestic manufacturing. Now, that's costly, but you can do it. Quick turnaround. And you're in the factory. If you don't like the way they're sewing or something's not working well for the first two or three garments, you change it quickly. That's the benefits of making it domestically. Can you make Walmart that way? No. No. So price is an issue. What are the challenges? And what are the problems to make it? here, making your business here. I'm not talking about making your samples or making that first line you want to show your first employer. Immigration status ruling. This is not a political statement, guys, but the law is, the federal law is, social security number. When you are hired, the first thing they ask you is for your social security number. Four months later, you get a letter from Social Security, no match. It's called a no match letter. The employer is responsible to fire that employee. The employee is not the villain here. The employer gets fined, and that employee must be fired. Now, in the immigration status, now, let me just tell you that 20% of the sewers in Southern California do not have status. So they go around the corner to Olvera Street and they get another Social Security card for another $10, okay? And that takes four months. That's the process right now. It has to stop. And I, that's my job, and I'll tell you about my job at another time, but we're a sanctuary city in a sanctuary state. So everybody is here, but they can't work. There's something wrong with this, okay? So they can pick Grapes in Fresno, but they can't sew a t-shirt. That's my fight right now. Industrial training. Every time you fire someone for that reason, there's no one to hire. There is no industrial training for sewing, for fixing machinery, not just in our business, but in any business. This state has decided that everybody should be a nuclear physicist or a technological genius, okay? People do want to work with their hands, and there is no industrial training. Equipment financing. Again, 
Only in the United States does the government not finance new equipment. When I had my company in my own name and I needed 10 machines, the bank owned those machines until I paid them off. That went out with TARP. That went out in the 80s with the big financial crisis. So there's no financing just for equipment. The problem with that is contractors, for the most part, do not have the credit worthiness to buy or lease machinery. And they usually have to ask someone else, the person they're working for, the person they're sewing for, the brand holder, to get them the new equipment. So these are the problems inherent in domestic manufacturing. Don't kid yourself. These are political barriers, not sewing barriers and not barriers for talent. However, and there's, uh, everything I'm going to tell you has a however. I just want you to know that. Who cares? Who really cares about Made in USA? Okay? This is a Harris poll last year. When you see an ad, are you more likely to buy it? So the older you get, the more you care. Anybody under 18 does not give a damn. They just want what they want when they want it. Okay, But the fact is, 75% of those polled at any age will only pay 15% more for something. That's the max if they really feel they want made in USA. So if you have a pair of jeans that are $100 or $115 or $117, the $100 jean will be bought whether it's made in USA or China. That's based on a poll. So now we go to who's the consumer and the fashion retailing today? And ladies and gentlemen, it has taken us 20 years to get to where we are now with the internet and all of that. And I will tell you that by the time you are in the executive world, five years from now, it will be changed. That's how fast things are changing. So whatever you're seeing now, be prepared. I'll be back in five years, and I will tell you how it is then. Okay? We are the only country in the world with these boxes. Every other country has distributors. The word distributor, meaning you find a distributor in China, in Mexico, in Chile, wherever. And that distributor then has control of where you sell your product. They have their own groups of stores. We don't have distributors. If you want to sell any of these boxes, you have to find the distribution method, the sales method, the technique, the pricing, what they want. But you need to know who is your customer. Who are you designing for? Who is your company working for? They can't work for Walmart and Saks at the same time. And they can't work for QVC and Macy's at the same time. So there are very, very many differences. And one of the biggest differences that you need to realize is who's got the money. The big black pie, the big red pie there, the specialty stores. You call them mom and pops, but they're more than mom and pops. The legal name is seven stores in one state. So these are not the specialty chains like Forever 21 or, or uh, Victoria's Secret, both of whom are on the verge of collapse financially, by the way. So this big red part of the puzzle in fashion retailing is where all creativity happens. Not Macy's, not Barney's, not Nordstrom's, not Kohl's, but there. The major stores look to the specialty stores to make the mistakes, to buy the markdowns. But the big stores want to play it safe. So their shopping centers on what is in the specialty stores. So what's it? your job? Your job is to get in front of the specialty stores. 
And this is the financial reality of that. Okay? I'm not giving a test. You don't have to worry about the numbers. Also, the reality is the breakdown. The red one is women's wear, yellow is men's wear, children's wear. This has doubled in 10 years. 10 years, it doubled. When I was in business, 80% of men's wear was bought by women. Their mothers, their girlfriends, their wives, their sisters. That's why Brooks Brothers has a women's wear department, because there were so many women buying for the men. Now, I have six grandsons. I can't buy them a t-shirt, okay? Don't buy me anything, Grandma. I'll pick it out myself. That's where men's wear is now. So that is the big increase. Children's wear, on the other hand, is static because you don't see too many specialty shops devoted to children's wear. That's a big store buy or an online buy now. And this is the department store. This is apparel at Macy's, apparel at Bloomingdale's, apparel at Nordstrom's, apparel at Dillard's. This is where apparel is in the major stores. That's not where people are buying fashion. They're buying underwear, maybe a belt, maybe socks, but not fashion. And this is what the majors are doing. You were talking about product development, okay? This is where it's going for the, the U.S. brand landscape through next year. They have all said retailers designing and sourcing for themselves, private label, will be 72%. So some genius buyer at Macy's is going to decide what is in the athleisure department. And that is going to create an additional problem for them. They are not looking for new things. The major brands have maintained themselves, but if you want to create a line and your goal is to be in Bloomingdale's, don't even think about it. That's not where to start with your ambition. And even private label is changing. It used to be J.C. Penney. They created the name Arizona Jeans. That's their brand. It's always been their brand. Inc. and Alfani has always been Macy's. Now they are buying companies. The consumer thinks these are brand designers. Juicy Couture, Nine West, Coles owns it. So anything you see with Juicy Couture is product of Kohl's private label department. Liz Claiborne, which was the largest sportswear line 20 years ago in the United States, is owned by Pennies. And Tommy Hilfiger, other than his standalone stores, his creative stores that he's doing deals with, Bella Hadid and all these people, those are his. But anything you see with the Tommy Hilfiger t-shirt, that belongs to Macy's. So the whole vision of private label, you could be working for a private label manufacturer. They are very, very successful and very large because the stores depend on private label manufacturers for the 70% of their product. So now you saw what's going down, look at what's going up, okay? You're looking at 60% of Saks stores are Saks off fifth. 57% of Nordstrom's business is Nordstrom Rack. Half of their, more than half of their business is off price. Now, off price is not what it used to be. It used to be the discards, the junk, the late merchandise. It used to be the mistakes. Every single one of these stores, Saks, Nordstrom's, Neiman's, now Macy's, you're going to see backstage all over the place. It's called backstage. It's Macy's. Has their own buyer, their own GM, their own president, their own product development group. And sure, it's based on what's in the main store. So in the case of Ralph Lauren, for example, if you go to their discount store, 
on the way to Palm Springs or on the way to Las Vegas, you'll see the same fabrication that is in Ralph Lauren at $400 and $500 as a shirt, but there's one pocket instead of two. There are five buttons instead of eight. The collar is not turned, or maybe there's no collar at all. It's a stand-up collar and no collar at all. So the basic commodity is still there. They're not buying separate fabric. They're just making it cheaper. But they have a whole separate organization for off-price. That is your opportunity. All of the people making for Nordstrom's Rack are your opportunity. Let me just say this to you statistically. The two best retailers in the country, by virtue of profitability and growth, are TJ Maxx and Ross Stores. And neither one of them has a sophisticated website or online purchasing. Profitability and growth, TJ Maxx and Ross Stores. And they have buyers that buy that product. As a share of apparel and footwear, it is significantly going, and again, without the benefit of significant e-commerce business. This is the reality last year. Now, a door is not a store. Macy's has 1,500 doors, so when they close 50, you know, everybody screams, but it's not a big deal. But the point is, as of March of this year, there were 4,300 closings compared to 2018. There were 5,500 in the whole year, in 12 months. So in three years of this year, we had almost the same amount as all of the year before. Doors, but openings, more openings. And we'll go into that later. What is an opening? A pop-up store is an opening. So by year end of 2020, next year, 80% of everything that's an in-store purchase will be influenced. And I say influenced because uh, it, it'll come, but I have a st I'll show you that influence does not mean bought. Online is the big gorilla in the room but only 15% of all apparel is bought online. 80% is researched. So, we are in a position of disruption and uncertainty. Everybody in the business will tell you that, and the older people will say, oh my God, it's not the way it used to be. Well, thank goodness, okay? Change is good. And the total amount of business being done in the United States in consumer products, and that's shoes, apparel, aprons, socks, children's wear, is up. We have a top to bottom transformation. The old way of you make a line, you show it to buyers at a trade show, the buyers put it in the store and hope it sells. Gone. Gone. That is not the reality of success right now. Amazon is 34% of apparel sales right now. They sh transforming the way consumers consume it and pay for it. And we have no fashion calendar. We're going to be wearing white pants in November, I am sure, okay? and sleep, not even just because it's warm out, because nobody cares anymore. Merchandising happens every 10 weeks. If you're not showing new product all the time, you are not gonna be in business doing three seasons a year, five seasons a year, every 10 weeks. So here's your problem with Amazon. Naturally, these are all branded, Calvin Klein, Nike, Lululemon, Carters. If Amazon decides next month, and there will be an Amazon sale, a big holiday offering, or because you're prime, you get 20% off, that means that I, as a retailer, if I have this piece 
this woman's jacket in my inventory and Amazon has it on sale, what do I have to do? I have to match it. So at Magic, and all of you, one of these days, you should trek over to Las Vegas during the trade show. Magic is the trade show in Las Vegas that happens twice a year, which, by the way, in case anyone ever gives you a test, was called Men's Apparel Guild in California. That's where the name Magic comes from, okay? So, at the Magic show, you had buyers going from booth to booth for lines that they usually bought and saying, are you selling Amazon? And if the answer is yes, they're moving on. So that structural change that we have now is going to change again. And how is it going to change again? Coming out. Amazon is coming out with two, four, six, but there's another two lines that when you're looking for a red hoodie or a black dress or a new sequin garment, up will pop, have you looked at this line? We may have something for you. And you won't know that it's an Amazon brand. Won't say Amazon. Their marketing strategy is to invade your shopping. Smart. Why not? So their sale this year, they're going to do $40 billion, which is 38% of a pound. That's a lot of business, OK? That's a lot of business. They hope to become the top US apparel retailer. So I'm going to tell you a secret. And don't tell anybody I told you, OK? So I, invited, I was invited up to the Amazon design room in Seattle, which is kind of an oxymoron. If any of you have been in Seattle, those are the worst dressed people in the universe, OK? <laughs> they have more money than anyone, in the more per capita dollars in Seattle, and they don't care about clothes. And these are the designers. So I am not going to worry about these Amazon lines being great or fashionable or perfect. They will be commodities. But you will see these brands popping into your eye line when you're looking for commodities. So the US market, what is the US market? We have regions. Whether you're shipping or selling Boston, San Francisco, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Miami, Paducah, Kentucky, wherever, it's all different. It's all different. There is nothing that stays the same. There are anecdotes about years and years ago when, do you any, does anybody here know, not know who Elizabeth Taylor was? Frightening, frightening sometimes, you know. <laughs> um, so she got the Academy Award for a picture called Butterfield 8, and she was coming out of her hospital for a tracheotomy, and so she pulled herself together, put a doctor's coat on and a ruffle around her neck. Three months later, every woman, junior child had a ruffle around their neck. It was that influential. Nobody does that anymore. It doesn't happen like that anymore. Every place you go, it's different. So when you understand your customer, and this is what I, I should have put this in the other one. This orange box is apparel in store. This little blue line here, that's apparel online. So this blue line we've put here. Within that blue line, in order to sell, it's still not chopped liver, it's $586 billion worth of e-commerce sales. Most of it is on desktop, smartphone, and tablet. That's how it's being sold. So when you are producing your product, and as an aside, I would ask that you leave today and every one of you get a business card and go into the trademark office online and trademark your name. 
because if you don't and you're successful, you might have lost it by the time you want your own business. That's the reality of IPR. But here you have the reality of online. Online sales, I'm going to do it online. I'm only going to have a website. I'm only going to sell it online. You're missing out. You're missing out. You have to research what's in the stores. So what is online? This is your responsibility, not because you're fooling around with it and you're watching it while you're eating dinner, okay? This is your responsibility to know what to do with this to be successful with your brand. And you, your face, is your brand. The website tells your story. It doesn't want to hear about Aunt Fanny or Uncle Harry. It wants to hear about your story. Blogs, grow your story. If you can't write an essay or write a blog, find someone who can. Facebook shares it. YouTube demonstrates it. Twitter constantly. Now you have Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest, all the rest. As a business person, I, personally, I don't do any of this. But as a business person, you must know its use and how to make use of it. The noise from all of this affects your ability to sell your brand. And some of these are now new. Goats, I had never heard of them before until I researched this. But believe me, 10 days from now, there'll be more. Isn't there a TikTok coming or something like that? Anyway. And now we have bloggers as brand builders. What used to be a brand builder? Vogue, 17, Harper's. When's the last time you guys ever looked at those other than research? Bloggers are the brand builders, and they all make money. 50% of the influencers charge about $20,000 a year. But let me just give you a fact of life now. And this, I think, um, are the realities of law that you, if you're going to be in business, must know about. It is against the law. FTC is the federal, 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 not state, trade commission. Influencer posts are deceptive endorsements. Unless it says, this is a paid post before the hashtag, not after the hashtag, before the hashtag, it is, now Naomi Campbell got caught with it, uh, Chia got caught, Christina, they're all getting caught with that, a fine, major fine, for as many days as it's up. So if your blogger, your influencer, is getting the merchandise free, or is being paid for it, they must say so. And that is now coming leaps and bounds. Everybody's getting a letter. The other law that you must know for your own sake is the right of publicity. If you see Gigi Hadid or her sister wearing your coat, and you put it on your website saying, see, she's wearing my coat. You will, this is now civil. You will not get sued. You will be, you will not be fined. You will be sued by Gigi's agent and the photographer. The photographer has the right to that picture. You cannot repost it. So what happens is as things change in life and in law and in fashion, a law comes up and screws everything up, truly. But nevertheless, you have to realize that you can't just say that some movie star wore this and I'm making something very similar, not without their permission. And you can do that. I mean, you can find out who the agent is, who they're represented, Send an email and say, do I have the right? Will you give me permission to use this? If they don't answer, it's a tacit yes. But you must make 
that um, you must make that leap. So we also have your new favorites, your multi-brand bloggers. I have gone to certain areas in schools and asked, what are your favorite brands? And someone will say, Farfetch. It's not a brand. It's a store. Whatever is in Farfetch, somebody else made. These are all Reformation, Fashion Nova, Farfetch. They don't make anything. They buy it from you. They buy it from people. And they buy it with major guarantees. So whether it's $29.99, $178, or $2,100, these people have followers. It's very important to these websites to develop followers. Revolve has 3,100 influencers all over the country. That's how they do their business. Multi-brand websites. And, I'm tell and I happen to know that both these genes, for Doen and opening ceremony, are made by Coos in Los Angeles. Same gene, same product. Same pant, same fit. But if you're a fan of opening ceremony, that's where you will go, and that's where you will buy it. So th this, the Eckhaus Lada is also very, very strong, an LA website. And then you have the single brand websites. So be aware that there's a major difference between a single brand website, in this case it's NYDJ, and a multi-brand website. These people are responsible for their own product. The others are not. They are just acting as a retailer. So a two, only two global, this is worldwide. Previous to this, we talked about L, uh, the United States. Globally, we have what's called transnational. What's happening here is happening there, wherever there is. And we have also the democracy of consumption. There's no such thing as waiting six months until it trickles down. Transnational fashion, when the one shoulder was in, it's still in. It was in Spain, Ukraine, Japan, Germany, and of course it was in the United States. These editors don't talk to each other. It's transnational fashion. I took these pictures in Guangzhou last August. These kids could be at school here. They could be at Berkeley, they could be anywhere. Transnational fashion, it's global. And fashion has no price, has no price. Whatever is in, you will buy it from whomever you are used to buying it from. You're not gonna look for the cheapest denim jacket. You're gonna go where you're comfortable buying it. Big change. Now this was, <laughs> this was something I did for the footwear industry in Las Vegas in February. This is the hot shoe. This is the hottest shoe. It was in February, it's still very big right now. The embroidered pointed slip-on. Union Bay at $1,199, Gucci at $1,150. All online at the same time. At the same time, I do know that the Charles David and the Milano are the same shoe made in the same factory, okay? This is where we are today. Fashion has no, whatever is in, is in at all price points. That's why it's so fast. And what is luxury? What is luxury? Do you really need to pay $150 for a pair of tights when you can buy them for $12 from Fabletics? But you like aloe, or you happen to be in aloe. But that is luxury right now. That is the new world. And then we have the power of celebrity. I love this. This is such fun. Okay, the power of, of untalented people who are very hot at the moment yeah. can sell B 
billions, billions, Jessica Simpson, with no talent whatsoever, made $800 billion in four years. That's the number. And the business is run by her mother. Okay? So, star power. We know what, what Kim Kardashian wore at the Emmys. We don't know what Gucci showed on the runway last week. That's the power of celebrity. It's not new. This is 1980. Brooke Shields in 1980. Some of you don't even know who she is. She is 60 now, which is absolutely scary. Right. Okay. But this had to, this was a billboard in Times Square that had to be removed because it was too sensitive. First of all, she was underage. She was only 15. Okay. It's a little racy for a 15-year-old. Secondly, no one ever talked about that publicly like that. Had to be removed from Times Square. But it made Calvin Klein. Prior to this, Calvin Klein was just a gown designer. He was no bigger, no better than Jason Wu or Philip Lim at that level. But he became a star designer because of the gene. So what is happening now? Licensing, where they're renting their names. As soon as somebody gets an agent, they want something, uh, they want a label. The most successful brand is Gwen Stefani for 24 years. She's not as young as she looks, by the way. But Harajuku and Lamb has been a brand for 24 years. She is the single largest earner of licensing. Now, what is licensing? She didn't make any of this. But there is a designer, one of you, working for all these products, right? They don't just get designed by themselves. Puff Diddy, I don't know what his name is right now, but he never has to sing again. He is the single largest menswear brand in the country for anything. Doesn't make anything. Owns none of it, just licenses. Jennifer Lopez is now coming up very strong, and we know why. She's all over the place, but it's home furnishings now. She just signed a, sh signed a shoe deal. I didn't put that up, but nevertheless, all of J-Lo, licensed, they don't own it. Now you have, now you have celebrity-owned brands. That's why I'm saying all of this is so transitory. You need to know what's going on right now so that you're not absolutely dumbfounded when it happens in the future. Now you have all of the, the Kardashians own everything that they make. Whatever's the name on, they own it. They don't license. The only thing they license is if they show up. It's $50,000 if you want a Kardashian to show up. I'm not kidding. That's reality, okay? Now you have Elizabeth and James, the row. You have the Ashley twins who have been at it for very long time. From Target to the row is all the twins. And now you have celebrity owned. This is the first time uh, Louis Vuitton has a partner, physical partner. This is not a license. This is Rihanna, the Fenty Maison, is her brand being made by Louis Vuitton. We'll see where that goes. The talent has not been significantly discovered yet, but nevertheless. Okay. So what you also have is brand licensing. These are brands that have been around enough for you to know who they are, but they only make this. Other companies make that. And all those other companies that are making that need you, need designers. You have Tory Burch, who is now doing high tech, and, and um, this is housewares and giftware. This is all she makes. That's all licensed. And Michael Kors, who licensed too much. Okay, but that's all right. <laughs> but this is Michael Kors. This is all licensed. 
But all of these licensing operations need talent because the person, Michael Kors, doesn't get into all of those companies. And what you have now is diffusion licensing. And here's the big question. This is the big question for the next four or five years. You have Target doing brands, okay? So you have Missoni for Target and Missoni. If you went on to eBay right now and looked for a Missoni scarf, you would not know whether it came from Italy or from Target. Was it $30 or was it $350? You don't know. How about this one? Gucci, Prada, Missoni for Costco? These are not knockoffs. This is diffusion licensing. Now, once you buy this Prada handbag for $349, that's how much they pay. Are you going to go and buy this one for $2,000? does not diffusion say to you, if it's cheaper, why am I spending the top dollar for it? That's where we're, that's the question that's happening now in terms of diffusion licensing. Because what is important is the difference between a knockoff and diffusion. It's very, very important. Intellectual property rights. Trademark, patent, copyright, counterfeit, trade dress, they're all different. And they all take if you are going into business, a line item is called lawyer. You will be sued one way or another in our business if you don't know the rules going in. This is a trademark. Guys, if you don't know who these people are, you should not be in the room. Okay? <laughs> they spend billions of dollars to establish the fact that you know these companies by their trademark. However, again, that word, this is a trademark case that went back and forth and back and forth, finally guess one. Gucci sold, sued guess. Trademark case. Went to the Supreme Court. Yeah, because, it, because Italian uh, US company. Guess one. Now you have patents. A patent is very rare in our business. It's either a construction patent or a design patent. When NYDJ first came out, that crisscross here to keep the tummy tucked was a, a design patent. Yummy Tummy sued Warnico for that one and won. That's a construction patent. Now in the courts, okay, you have Lululemon versus Under Armour. This is still in the courts. They patented this in 2014, and then they repatented it because they understood how fast this business works. And Under Armour says it came from our design room. You know, it's just there to hold the boobies up. Now they're fighting that one. So you see that even big companies. Here you have copyright. Copyright is the bane of our existence in the, in the apparel business. Copyright is only artwork. It's only prints. It's only the back, the, the back of a jean where you do that embroidery or whatever. You send $40 to U.S. Copyright Office and you have a copyright. Please note in this room the lack of prints. The effect of the preponderance of cases of copyright law has affected the way we design. Here's one that's in the courts now. No, this was Urban Outfitters lost. This is Unicolors, which is a very big print house. This is Urban Outfitters, okay? Urban Outfitters lost. And it was quite an interesting case because they bought it in China from a Chinese mill that had it in black and white and with a multi, the books are this thick, by the way, in China. They call them open line screens. And this was in China as an open line screen. But it was an open line. When it got to the shores of the United States, it had been a copyrighted print from Unicolors, so they did lose, but it took a lot. Copyright for jeans, again, it's only 
the tushy. Now, the red little piece in Levi, that's a trademark. Do not even think about putting a red tag on anything. They will come after you. Which brings us, oh, well, counterfeit is a given. It's when you use the brand's name and replicate the style. This was, this came in a container load of this. And the only reason U.S. Customs found it was because it didn't rattle. It said brooms. It came in as brooms. And it was true religion jeans, and they had trouble looking for how fake it was. It was that good. But it came in, made in USA, in a container load, and it was counterfeit. And now you have trade dress. And I say now because there's no law yet written that is clear on this. You have to go all the way to court to decide what is trade dress. The one that just won in the Supreme Court is Louboutin. Now it's not orange, it's not puce, it's not pink, it's that color Pantone. That Pantone red. You cannot put on the bottom of a shoe. Now who was it that they were fighting? Saint Laurent. There was not a small case here. Saint Laurent did an all red shoe. Red soles, red bottoms, red everything in that color. And Louboutin said, that's my color, my trade dress. Don't even think about making a bottle in the shape of Coca-Cola or putting a white ribbon around a box of azure blue. That's Tiffany. They will come right after you. Okay. The most interesting one is Chanel. You can't, in your copy, in your line sheet, say a Chanel-type jacket without hearing from Chanel. Don't use the name. But please pay attention to this before you get all hot and bothered when you see somebody doing what you do. It's legal. Kate Middleton, the future queen of England, her dress in 2001, here it is from Kleinfeld's in 1991. Now, McQueen did not copy a Kleinfeld dress. But what can you do when you want long sleeves, a V-neck, drop torso, and a lot of lace? It's a dress, guys, OK? The same thing with her sister. This was all the rage. Alexander McQueen dress, 2011. Meanwhile. He did it himself in 2009. Pre-fall collection, and then Cameron Diaz wore, wore it to the Golden Globes. Knockoffs are legal because they're, it's a craft. Pattern making is a craft. This was the dress that tried to get the law passed. We went to Washington to fight the fact that the CFDA wanted knockoffs to be made illegal, OK? As they said, as in Europe. I will explain the difference in a minute. Now, Cisco Rodriguez himself came with this dress, which was the wedding dress of the ill-fated Mrs. John Kennedy. And he said, everybody knocked off that bridal dress. And my office found a Vogue pattern from 1960 that was the same dress. How much can you do with a slip dress on the bias? That becomes the question. And then Madame Furstenberg was all hot and bothered. She was the president of the CFDA at the time. She invented the wrap dress, and we beg to differ, OK? Here it is in the 60s. She did it in 75, and then here it is in 1942. Little bit of research, and you find anything that was designed for the body. It, pattern making is a craft. Red carpet knockoffs, they consider it the cost of doing business. And then what would we do, ladies, when we're having a manicure if we didn't watch these magazines showing everybody's knockoff from jewelry to clothing? Have you seen this? 
So what are our lessons here? Good design is not enough. Sorry, but it's not enough. Sizing is different. It's not standardized. Some retailers have their own sizing. Some demographics have their own sizing. Some ethnicities have their own sizing. Labeling requirements. Your entire shipment can be confiscated if you're labeling incorrectly. It's not, if it's not silk, don't say it is. Shipping costs. When you're doing your line sheets, and I certainly hope you're doing cost sheets for everything you design, shipping is not free. There's no such thing as free shipping. That's got to be costed in. And U.S. Customs current requirements, we have a case right now where a pajama maker, PJs, pajama bottoms with the elastic all the way around have 13% duty. They wanted to be creative, so they put two buttons and a fake fly, and it was 37% duty, because now it's pants. Knowing the U.S. Customs harmonized codes, most of our major manufacturers have somebody with the harmonized code book, which is this thick, in the design room. If you make five buttons versus four, different duty. Two pockets versus one, different duty. Somebody is saying, uh, 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 and intellectual property. You have to guard against that. And to all of you, I must say, no one does it alone. I know you are all creative geniuses, no question about it, but no one is successful, no one, without knowing the other side of the coin. The only one that I can think of in my years is Karl Lagerfeld, who never owned anything. He never was a partner in any of his companies, and not a partner in Chanel. He wasn't even a partner in the brand that has his own name. He was not a partner in Fendi. He just may just don't worry about what he lived on. But he's the only one I have ever heard of that said, I don't want to know about anything but design. I hope you are as good as Karl Lagerfeld, but somehow I doubt it. So I could do another two hours on this issue because this is the issue du jour, sustainability, environmentalism, and green. And the reason I say that we can't touch it now we understand that it's clear. Consumers want to make a difference. Retailers are starting to ask for it. Employees, you want to work for somebody who cares. But we can't determine how much it costs yet. Meaningful change comes. What do you mean by sustainability? What is it you want? If we were all sustainability conscious, we'd all be in beige right now in this room. Or moss green or off-white. But that's it. Okay. And the other trend now is clicks to bricks. Every single online operator is going into retail again. That's where the new stores are coming from. There is a 34% return factor. One out of three boxes that you receive, I guarantee you, you're shipping back. If it's footwear, 54% goes back because you're buying two sizes to see which fits, and sometimes neither one fits, right? You can't make money as a, as a retailer with all that return. Where is it going to go? It's going to go into a store. So you have clicks to bricks. What was once now only digital in thinking, the Revolve is going and, and Reformation is also going, and Rent the Runway is going. I could add to this a whole nother column. And this is a lesson to be learned about how fast things are moving. 2010, nine years ago, nine years ago, that's what this chart said, the cool kid, that's the chart, the cool kid, when somebody outside of school liked this, then it became fashionable, a Barney's product, and it went all the way out to Walmart with Crocs and cargo pants, okay? 
That took two years to get to that and four years out the door. It's now 10 weeks. 10 weeks for a cool day of creation to become adopted by the internet, by retailers, adopted. But it's only one year and it's over. Over. That's the change and it's coming at us fast and furiously. So please be aware that whatever you're learning today, forget about it. In five years, it'll be different. What's coming that I'm not going to touch in depth, but artificial intelligence, AI. That this is all data analytics. How do they decide at Stitch Fix what to put in that box? Analytics. They know what sizes, where you go for lunch, what you eat, what's your pattern of living. Algorithms give data to predict the product, the features that customers want. Fabulous information, fabulous study here. You have 3D coming. We already have Rothy. I don't know how many of you know Rothy footwear. They're fabulous. Out of San, they're up here, San Francisco. 3D knitting and quick dry technology into footwear. Recycled plastic water bottles. It is not perfected yet to mass, but everybody's working on these things. Robotics. Nike already ro uses robotics to make the bottoms of shoes and to put the laces in. Grab it, co collaborate. I think they're also up here, or Seattle, with Nike to make sneakers. All of these things next year will be things you need to learn about. So, this is the last. What do you have to do to be successful? Product is only one part of it, guys. Only one part of it. You have to know data and technology. Experience. What is experience? It's the fact that you can't touch anything on the internet. You want to go into the store. You want to touch it, feel it. Entertainment. You're going into a mall not to buy clothes. You're going into a movie. You're going to go eat. There are many, many things you're going into a mall. And you're part of that entertainment. And business is different. Okay? When I was, I uh, now, I am not around since 1924. So let's not get carried away here with age. But Mr. Selfridge, Selfridge is the largest retailer in London. And Mr. Selfridge came from Macy's. And he has in cement over the doors of Selfridge the right product in the right place at the right time. It's over. It's over. The right offer for the right consumer in the right channel with the right voice. Okay? That's the business today. Product has nothing to do with it. The right offer for the right consumer, the right channel, the right voice. That's where we are. And your success will be to be an entrepreneur. Your success will not be in a corporate structure. Legacy branding is over. There will not be another Nike. There will not be another Levi. Because by the time your company gets to be of a certain age as as our venture capitalists and, and mergers and acquisitions know, they, you will be swooped up with lots of money in the bank, but that brand will be gone. So legacy branding is a thing of the past, but we need you to understand the process. My little talk today is just the process. You're out there designing, but the process of bringing it to market. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. And that's all we have to say on that. <laughs> Gabriel asked me when I came up to talk about job opportunities, okay? So I have a separate, very, very short 
presentation on that. But do we want to stop and ask questions? We don't have time for that? I don't think we have time. Okay. For that. Then we. So uh, what good advice could you give to someone who's trying to get in the industry or is trying to make it out there, like, for example, um, eventually want to brand it off and do their own business? I know you talked about a lot of these licensing. Um, is that a good thing to do if that's something you want to get Well, into? you can't license until you establish yourself as a brand. Right. So there's nothing to license. However, okay. to work for a licensor, to work for a handbag company that is making the guest's handbag, you at least understand the process. And when I say work for somebody, you all need to work for one, two, maybe 10 different companies. Because no two companies are the same. No two companies, if a company is run by a designer, it's one thing, run by a salesperson, run by a production manager, it's all run differently. And the more you can understand about how it all runs, that probably will take you three to four years. And then you think about doing it on your own. But to think about doing your own business without first understanding the process is to waste your father's money. And it's usually your father or your uncle or somebody like that. Okay. Um, yes, any other questions? Please. Um, yeah, as students, do we have, I know you said that like copy, that copying, um, product is legal in a way, but as students, do we have any rights to say, because like just recently the Moschino copied a younger designer mm -hmm. and there was like this huge fuss, but do they, we have any right? They copied artwork, like what you're wearing. That's copyrightable. Mm -hmm. That's artwork. Uh, a print. But if it's style, if it's a sleeve or a collar or a puffy skirt, yeah, not protectable. So if, if I'm a student, what should I start like copywriting all of my techniques now? Artwork. Artwork. Yes, artwork. You could do your whole semester's artwork. In other words, the graphics that you've created. And that's a cluster. You don't have to do $40 per page. It could be a cluster of your artwork. Yeah, you can copyright that. So that when you go to show someone, this is what I do, this is the kind of artwork I do, you have a big C at the bottom of it. They won't touch it. Not a technique. Pardon like, me? Not a technique, like how the, like Chanel has like the quilted bag. That's not a technique. That's, that's just, that's craft. Okay. That's craft. Uh, it's very, very different, like lace is a problem. You can't copyright a lace pattern. Any others? Yes, ma'am. You made a comment about sustainability and if we are all really environmentally conscious, we'd be wearing moss green, beige, and off-white. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the future since... Are you aware of the Higgs index? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. I'll leave this with you. This is the Higgs Index. It was created by Patagonia, Walmart, Target, and two other major, uh, and two yarn companies. The Higgs Index. It gives uh, an index of how your facility, your brand, and your product should be handled. Now, nobody's 100% except Patagonia. And I'm not being facetious. They started that way 30 years ago. You cannot walk into the offices of Patagonia in Santa Barbara with a piece of paper, not even a business card. There is no paper. Everything is absolutely environmentally safe, 
and sane. And they started that way. He's a mountain climber. He's a fabulous man. And he and Walmart and Target have developed an index by which you at least can measure the steps you are taking. If you are making product in any place other than your own facility, you cannot control it. That's a fact. You cannot control it. It's not your job. It's not your business. You can say, I won't buy from you unless you are treating your staff well, but you can't control the way they do business. So it's very difficult to measure up to 100%, but at least there's an index that the industry is going by. At this point, overall, the industry is at 34%. Okay, not good, but it's certainly better than cosmetics. Anybody buy a tube of lipstick this small and it comes with a box this big? Okay, so there are industries that are worse than apparel, but um, that's the point that everyone is striving for. The problem is environmentalism, sustainability, the green, does not equate with red carpet dressing and uh, the fashion of the moment. If you want Swarovski crystal or beading or feathers, you are not green. So fashion fights sustainability. But there is there's a lot of talk about it. Yes, anything else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, my money person. <laughs> June, yes. Um, great talk. Uh, thank you very much. My question is about the, your comment you made earlier about Alibaba is lack of the predictive uh, analysis. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more there? Do you think that can... Uh, I know Alibaba, many people from Alibaba, they, well, they're really data-driven. Uh, yeah, data yeah. right. Alibaba is a whole other conversation I think I'll have on the other side because it won't affect... This okay. at all. Or, or Amazon, yeah. you know, they're, they're Well, Amazon, driven. it's Can the same. Your Amazon and Alibaba, the same. Amazon cannot get arrested in China, okay? Right, right. Yeah, okay, but, so. But I'm cu curious about the, the trend and analysis that can, can that be digitalized and, and using AI to... to no, to trends cannot be digitalized. <laughs> That's the beauty of the business you guys are in. No one will replace you. A robot cannot create a trend. A robot cannot create color matches that work. A robot cannot look at you or you or you and say, hmm, I think this will look good on you. No. Design and creativity is not a matter for robotics. And that's something that, that you all bring to the table. That's still there. The first part is the idea. First is an idea. Then is the design. And after that, it's the implementation. I have a question from online. Uh, so someone is asking, can you please explain the difference between patent and trademark again? Yes. A trademark, a trademark is something that defines you. And I would suggest that all of you trademark your name and do a little squiggle with it, something. Something that's a little squiggle with it. Trademark it now. You may never use it. That defines you as a person. A patent, you have invented something. You have invented something either from the standpoint of uh, design that's never been done before or construction that's never been done before. Uh, tr uh, patent started with the hull of boats, by the way. Those are the first things that got patented boats, how to, how to make something float. But the idea that a patent is something that no one else can do, it takes $40,000 pat from the idea to the patent. Until there's a search, until they find that it's unique in the world, because a patent is worldwide. A, um, and a trademark, you really have to protect from country to country. But there's a big difference between patent and trademark. Anyone can have a trademark. Anyone can have a trademark. Not everyone can do a patent. It's very selective. Yes? I'm going 
glad you I think got we're out it. of time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give us a, a round of applause. Also, if you don't mind, can I forward the, the PowerPoint piece that has to do with employment and provide it to our faculty to give to the yes. students? Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let me say a word about our scholarship. Uh, um, California Fashion Foundation, we're the association. We're the association of the banks, the factors, the lawyers, the big companies from guests to some of the smaller companies. Uh, we have about 400 members, but we also have a foundation and that gives scholarships to every school that's a member of the California Fashion Association. So we have 19 schools, of which your school is a member. So every year they send somebody, some, I don't know, Gabriel, whoever is in charge of it, pick three people, and we pick one of the three. So we don't combat, we don't peg one school versus another school. Your school will have a scholarship. Uh, every year, there's a, a financial a reward to the one person that is selected from the three you've selected. So, and you get to come to LA um, and be part of our our visual. So that's that's something that we do every year, and we hope some of you show up. Terrific. Okay. Thank you again. <laughs>